Hey, welcome back to the channel, everyone. And in this video, I'm excited to introduce you to AWS Cloud from Amazon. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the foundational concepts surrounding AWS Cloud, which is currently the leader in cloud providers. Specifically, we'll begin with a definition of AWS Cloud. We'll talk about how it stacks up against the competition. We'll talk about how it is available worldwide, and that worldwide infrastructure is divided into regions and availability zones. We'll define those for you and explain their benefits. And at the time of this recording, uh, AWS Cloud has over 200 services available. And in this video, we'll introduce you to a few of the more popular services. Then in the second part of this video, I want to share with you one of the main benefits of AWS Cloud, or really cloud computing in general, not just AWS Cloud, and that is pay-as-you-go pricing, where we don't have to purchase the infrastructure for a data center pay for the equipment, pay for the HVAC system, pay for the facility. No, with the cloud provider, we can just pay as you go. And we'll get into that discussion again in the second part of this video. And this video is really a compilation of a couple of videos from my AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner video training series. Now, currently at the time of this recording, this course is still in development, but later on in this video, I'll tell you how you can get access to the videos that are already available in this AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner video training series. But now let's get into an introduction to AWS Cloud. In this video, let's get an overview of AWS Cloud, beginning with the question, what is AWS? Well, it is the largest cloud computing platform in the world, and it's made up of data centers scattered around the world, and it offers us much more than just the ability to run a virtual machine in the cloud, Currently, there are over 200 services offered by AWS Cloud, and it's continually growing. Let's take a look at how AWS stacks up market share-wise against some of its competitors from Microsoft and from Google. And of course, market share numbers are going to change over time, but these numbers were as of Q3 of 2022. And as of Q3 2022, Amazon had over one-third of the cloud hosting market, coming in at 34%. Microsoft Azure, 21%, and Google Cloud at 11%. And AWS has data centers around the world. They've defined different regions of the world. They actually call them regions. And at the time of this recording, although it will definitely grow in the future, but at the time of this recording, there are 30 regions worldwide. And AWS has identified five additional regions that are coming soon. And please understand that when we talk about a region, we're not talking about just one data center. Within a region, and we'll talk about this later in the video, but within one region, we have different data centers. They're in different availability zones, but AWS Cloud has defined these regions around the world. What is the reason for all these regions? Well, for one thing, it can reduce latency from one point in the world to another point in the world. Let's say, for example, we had a customer in London, and our data center was in Los Angeles. Well, if that customer in London sent a request to the data center in Los Angeles, it would take a measurable amount of time to send the request to Los Angeles, have it processed, and send it back to London. Even though our data is traveling at near the speed of light, it could still take a measurable amount of time because we're talking about such vast distances. In fact, in our example, if we did travel at the speed of light from London to Los Angeles and went in a direct path, and when we got to the data center, our request was processed infinitely fast, and then it was returned to us in London, that would take about 59 milliseconds, which might not seem like much, but that is starting to be a significant delay depending on what computing resources we're running. So that's a big advantage of having regions around the world. We can have customers interact with a region closer to them to reduce delay or latency. And another benefit for having multiple regions is redundancy. We don't have one region that's a single point of failure. For example, there is an Ohio region and there is a Northern Virginia region. And let's say that for some reason, uh, the Ohio region became unavailable, which is not likely because remember, a region is made up of geographically separate data centers in different availability zones. But if the entire Ohio region became unavailable, we've got some failover. If we've deployed our resources in the Northern Virginia region, and is one other benefit that I want you to consider, having regions in different countries, that's gonna better equip us to handle any compliance requirements that we might have for a specific country. For example, the European Union has the GDPR regulation, 
And in the United States, we have HIPAA regulations, and different countries around the world have their own set of regulations that dictate how we have to handle data. Well, we could have a region in that country, and we make sure that everything in that region is adhering to that country's standards. And the ability to do that is a feature that we refer to as data sovereignty. And I was mentioning a moment ago that a region was not just one data center. A region defines these geographically separate areas in the world. And by leveraging computing resources in a region in close proximity with our customers, we can reduce latency. And I mentioned that at the time of this recording, AWS Cloud has 30 regions and they have 96 availability zones. And every region has at least two and sometimes more availability zones. These are isolated locations within a region. But even if availability zone A becomes unavailable, if we have deployed backup resources in availability zone B in that very same region, then we can fail over to that. And now that we have a better understanding of the AWS Cloud global infrastructure, let's ask the question, what problems does AWS solve? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just the ability to stand up a virtual machine in the cloud. There are currently over 200 services offered by AWS Cloud. And in this video, just to give you a sampler platter, let's take a look at five of the more popular AWS services, beginning with EC2 or Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. This is going to allow us to provision a virtual server. So instead of running a VMware ESXi on a physical server in our data center, we can have Amazon run their hypervisor on their physical server, and we install a virtual machine on top of that. And when we're provisioning that virtual server, we can optimize it for budget, where we pay less and get less performance. We can optimize it for CPU, where we have faster processing power. Maybe we have a large database and we want to store part of that in memory. We could optimize for memory. Or maybe we have large storage demands. We could optimize for storage. That's EC2. And speaking of storage, another very popular AWS cloud service is S3. That stands for Simple Storage Solution. This is going to give us secure and scalable cloud-based file storage. And S3 uses something called object storage. This allows us to store data as unstructured objects in what are called buckets. And with this type of storage, we don't have to worry about filling up a hard drive like we might in a data center. Because of these unstructured objects, they could physically reside on different hard drives. But logically, they're all in the same bucket and we can grow that as big as we want. Compare that to block storage. That's what's oftentimes used in a data center. If you're using something like iSCSI to retrieve data over a network, you're probably using block storage. This is going to organize our data as blocks, and these blocks are of a fixed size. The advantage is it can give us quick retrieval of information, but the storage location for our data is on a physical device that could fill up. And that's as compared to file storage, which we might have locally on our computer, on our desktop or laptop. And that's where we organize files into this folder structure. And again, we run the risk of filling up that storage device. But that's not going to be a concern with Amazon S3. Next up, let's consider a couple of database services. Some databases use a language called SQL. That's Structured Query Language. And we often hear that pronounced as SQL. We talk about a SQL server that's able to access database resources. However, there are some database servers out there that do not use SQL. Those are called NoSQL database servers. And depending on what your database needs are, you might want to go one direction or the other. But AWS Cloud has a NoSQL database server called DynamoDB. They also can support various SQL servers that are out there, and that's done with their Relational Database Service, or RDS. And here on screen, we can see some examples of SQL databases that are supported by RDS, including Amazon's Aurora. That's their SQL database. There's also Microsoft SQL and MySQL. And as one other example in this overview video, let's consider the Lambda service. This can give us some huge cost savings as opposed to running a virtual machine all the time. Here we can perform services that could be performed on a server, but this is a serverless platform. And that means that when Lambda detects a specific event, it's going to run code in response to that. And all of the underlying computer resources that are required to run that code, they don't have to already be provisioned on an EC2 instance. No, those resources are automatically allocated. And after the code finishes running, then those resources are given back 
And we don't have to pay for the resources during that time because they're not being used. And that's an overview of AWS Cloud. Before we get into the second part of this video, I wanted to let you know about how you can access all of the courses in our library, including some of the pre-release content like you're watching now, for less than a dollar a day. It's what we call our All Access Pass, and it's going to give you streaming access to all of our current courses in addition to the courses that are still in development, such as CCST Networking and AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner. And that's what's in development at the time of this recording, but we have lots of other updates coming out soon, like the update to Encore and Anarsi, and there'll be a CCNA later this year and an update to CL Core. So lots of updates coming to this library, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to do it. Instead of charging $399 for a course, which is going to be updated at some point, I decided to make this training much more expensive accessible by letting you subscribe for just $29 a month and you get access to everything. And what everything actually means, that's going to change continually as we make these updates. But at the time of this recording, here's what's in this All Access Pass library. And again, $29 a month, or if you want to go ahead and sign up for a year, you get two months free. So one payment of $290 gets you access to all of this and all the changes we're going to make over the next year. And that's way less than you would pay for a single course. Now, I don't know when you're watching this video, so this list of courses might be different. Be sure to go out to kwtrain.com slash all hyphen access. And under the FAQs, you're going to see a listing of all the currently available titles. And also on this page, there are buttons that allow you to sign up for either the monthly or the yearly plan. So whatever works best for you, check it out at kwtrain.com slash all hyphen access and get access to our entire library of courses for less than a dollar a day. Now let's get into the second part of our video. A big advantage of AWS Cloud as compared to a traditional data center has to do with how we pay for the resources that we have. First, consider a traditional data center. Here we might have to buy equipment to give us the computing capacity that we think we're going to need. We're going to have to guess or forecast what we think we might need in the future. And also, do we want to buy extra equipment to handle periodic spikes in demand? and the decision we make there about how do we handle peak demand, that could dramatically impact our customer experience. And as we're paying for these resources in a traditional data center, we might have a large one-time payment. Here, we've bought a rack of servers for a significant amount of money. And on this graph, we're saying that that y-axis, the vertical axis, that represents the computing resources we have, which I've represented as the height of that data center rack, and the computing resources that we need at the moment. I've represented that with the orange curved line you see on screen. And you'll notice that anything below that orange line indicates those are needed resources at that moment. And the green indicates that we're using resources from that rack of servers that we bought. However, that curved line is varying in the amount of computing resources we need over time. And you'll notice that anything above that orange line is shaded in red. That means we have the capacity to do more. And we paid for that capacity when we bought that rack of servers, but that area shaded in red is indicating those are unused resources. We have over-provisioned. And let's say that we're acquiring a company or we're going to go through a big expansion, and we anticipate, we forecast an increase in computer resource demand, and we decide we need to buy another rack of servers. So we buy another rack of servers, essentially doubling the computer resources we have available. And again, over time, we can see with that orange line, the demand for computing resources, it varies over time. And anything above that orange line shaded in red, that is unused capacity that we paid for. So in this data center example, we had two large expenses to acquire equipment. And hopefully that equipment will give us years of service. But we noticed that over time, we had provisioned or we had purchased more computing resources than we actually needed. Now let's compare this traditional data center approach to what we would do in the cloud. With a cloud deployment, we can do something called a pay-as-you-go pricing. Here, we can pay for the resources we use, much like you might do in your home where monthly you're paying an electric bill for the amount of electricity that you used in the previous month. And one of the great things about that is we didn't have to come up with a big chunk of money to buy equipment in the beginning. Over time, we're just paying much smaller amounts of money for the resources that we're using. We didn't over provision. We didn't have to purchase a lot of equipment. We just pay as we go. 
And that's the key point I want you to take away from this video. And that is with AWS Cloud, customers can trade their fixed expense, such as buying a rack of servers, for a variable expense, where over time they pay just for the resources they use using pay-as-you-go pricing.